chapter 1 verses 4 to 10. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 to 10. Let's read responsively in honor of God's word. Verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Before you were born, I consecrated you. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. The Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, but to all the people I say, you shall go. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Together, see, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, I love to start my stor uh, um, sermon with stories, and uh, today is uh, no exception. And I usually talk about history uh, in England. Uh, so you might be wondering why always passages talk about you know European history or you know uh, these uh, uh, British history. It's not that I'm a you know. Uh, uh, a, profess, uh, a professional in that area. But, uh, you know, there are people who lived as Christians ahead of us. And so we learn from them the good and the bad and the ugly sometimes. And one of those uh, examples I find from history is from King Henry III of the 11th century in England. He was a king, a monarch, who was tired of reigning. He was tired of, of all the affairs of the state. Imagine, you know, just running your home, running a team in your maybe uh, workplace. It's hard enough, but think about, imagine running a whole country. So many issues, so many burden on your back, on your shoulder, and uh, you want to quit. And that's what uh, King Henry wanted too. So he applied to be a monk at a monastery. Uh, he applied to Prior Richard, uh, this prior called Richard said, uh, I want to live the rest of my life in quietness, meditation, and peace, and in prayer. And so when this uh, prior, Richard, uh, received the application, he had a personal interview with the king. Your majesty, you must understand, the life of a monk is a life of obedience. And you've been a king all this, so many years, and it might be a little bit hard for you. And uh, King Henry said that he understood the terms. And he said, uh, I will obey everything that you say prior uh, as you lead according to the will of Christ in my life. And so with that agreement, uh, prior Richard, he uh, commanded the king with one thing. Uh, your majesty, I want you to obey me. I want you to go back to your throne and start reigning on the country again, as you're supposed to. So um, he went back to his throne and reigned his kingdom, and he was a good king. And history tells us, he uh, recollects his reign of England at, the, at that time, said the king learned to rule by obedience to Christ. So we find that the king, he, although he was tired and he was weary, he didn't want to reign, but uh, because he realized that this was an act of obedience to God, he was able to finish his duty and his reign. Uh, just the same as we, we get tired too every day, right? Of your duties, of your obligations, and uh, your routine. We get tired. We want to quit. We feel like that. Maybe each day as we live here in the Bay Area. But we remember that the person that called us to that place, that put us that, uh, in the, that position in the first place is God, and that we are obeying God's commands, not necessarily obeying our boss, bosses, but we're obeying the one person, the ultimate authority that put us there. It gives us the persistence. It gives us the courage. It gives us the energy and power to continue on the mission that God has given to each and every one of us. Some of us are called to be accountants. Some of us, others are called to be teachers. Some are called to be mothers and fathers. These are all amazing and great responsibilities. 
as we realize who we are and what we're supposed to do, we, when we understand our identity and our mission in life, we can persevere to the end. In fact, my message from Jeremiah is on that topic of identity and the mission that God has given us. As we march through the series of the prophet and kings, uh, God is trying to reveal to his people how he pursues them, how he loves the people. At the same time, he is conveying to us what he expects of us, what kind of life he expects us to live as a God who pursues us and who never gives up upon us. The question we want to answer, ask and answer this morning from this text in chapter 1 is, how can we fulfill, how can you fulfill your godly mission, your God-given mission in life? How can we fulfill that mission? And we look at no other than the calling of Jeremiah, the prophet, this morning. We find at least two principles of what helped Jeremiah fulfill or maybe initiate his mission calling for life. The first is this. He had to remember that God gave him a mission from birth. God, in fact, gave us a mission from birth. This fact would be, this reminder would be a stimulus for us and for Jeremiah to finish the mission. To say it more layman terms, so to speak, uh, we were born ready. Right? We were born ready to serve. That's what it's saying. In verse 4, we find God speaking to this man called Jeremiah. Verse 4, Now the word of the Lord came to me, this is Jeremiah, and uh, Jeremiah shares with us what God had spoken to him. To think about a little bit more information about Jeremiah, in verse 1, which we haven't read, we find that he is a person of Judah. He is a uh, Judite, Judaite, and uh, he is from a family of priests, priestly family, and there was nothing special about Jeremiah, really, because uh, he wasn't, his family wasn't in office right now. He was just one of those many priestly families and one of those sons. Uh, in the uh, big family. And it says, The word of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth, it says, in the land of Benjamin. So he was just one of them. He was just a common uh, son of a priest. But what is uncommon is God's uncommon calling for this Jeremiah's life. And he discovered that very quickly as he shares what he heard from God with us. Verse 5, what did God say to him? He said, Before I formed you, Jeremiah, in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. There's only one person in the whole entire universe can, that could make this statement, right? Not even your own mother who birthed you can say this, you know, because they don't know what's going on in the womb. They just see the child when it comes out. Only one person, which is God, creator of all things, God almighty and all omniscient, he is the only person that can say such a statement to Jeremiah. It meant that God knew Jeremiah when, from, when he was a fetus, right? Maybe from when he was just a single cell organism, when he was first fertilized. You know, God knew how tall he would be, what his character, what his personality would be like, what would be his pros and cons of his character. He knew all of this. And he knows this for a reason. So that he, he was, in fact, forming Jeremiah, custom making, custom building him for a specific, very specific mission and purpose. Whether Jeremiah recognized it or he didn't, uh, God had a plan for Jeremiah, and God was revealing that, that plan to him. He was saying, you will be a prophet to many nations. I know through adolescence, maybe you, all of us, maybe kind of wondered, who am I and what am I going to do? And what if God told you, you know, you're going to be a teacher, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be an accountant or a mom? You wouldn't have wasted so much of your life, right? You knew what you're going to do. You're just going to straight and be really good at it. Well, Jeremiah was privileged to have this information that he would be a prophet. It was a great honor and privilege to speak on behalf of God. And uh, at a, such a young age, he was called by God and realized that God 
specifically called him out by name, and he custom built Jeremiah from his womb at the very existence, his very first beginning. That would have given him goosebumps with, with just honor and, and humility and this great honor that God had given him. I want to ask you a uh, kind of different question this morning. How much do you think this pulpit is worth? Right here, you know, the wooden, uh, the stand that you see this morning. Uh, you know, I did some search on the internet, and uh, you know, a wooden structure like this, a pulpit or a stand, would uh, cost anywhere from like the cheaper version would be like three hundred dollars to maybe seven, eight hundred dollars. Uh, but this pulpit is very special, and some of you old timers know what I'm talking about because this was given by a, a couple, especially a, a gentleman who was a carpenter. And uh, I married them, right, at, here in this chapel. And uh, uh, he was, they were so thankful that they wanted to gift the church uh, some way. So he handcrafted this pulpit. No matter how much you search on the web, you will not find anything like this anywhere. So going back to my first question, how much do you think this is worth? How much do you think? Any carpenters out there? Any garage, you know, you know, carpenters out there? I don't know how much it will cost, but in the terms we would like to use, it would probably be priceless. You cannot put a price on such a work of art, and especially because he made a custom built for my height. Thank goodness I don't get taller, right? <laughs> and so he said, take it with you wherever you go, <laughs> even if you leave church, Pastor Joseph. I don't know if I can, but, you know, this is a very special uh, thing to me and to the church. We don't call this kind of thing a product, something that's, you know, manufactured in a, a, a factory is what a product is. We call this a piece of art, a work of art. And uh, especially if that uh, creator, the craftsman is not just your average age Joe and working in the garage, but a professional carpenter, a master carpenter, this would be a work of art, a masterpiece, and you cannot put a price on such a thing. And in some respect, God was saying the same to Jeremiah. I have created you, handcrafted you, the creator of the universe, the master creator, the master a craftsman of the universe has crafted you, and you have been custom built for a very specific purpose, and I call you to be a prophet for many nations. What a humbling, you know, revelation that is. And uh, you can imagine the awe that uh, Jeremiah would have um, felt as he realized the God of the universe has known him since he was conceived and he has a great purpose for him. In fact, who we are determines what we do. Jeremiah had to first realize who he was in order to fulfill his calling, for to fulfill his mission. In fact, what, what we do in life on the basis of our identity is called mission. I'm not talking about mission work, for mission work, medical aid, or you know, vacation Bible school for kids. I'm talking about our life purpose. What God has given us as an identity, and we express that. Expression of our identity, God-given identity, is called a mission of God. God gave every one of us in this room a unique mission in life, a different purpose in life. When we realize what that purpose is for us, just like Jeremiah, he revealed, it was revealed to him and he realized what it was. When we realize what it is, then we get to live out the mission that God has given to us. Again, the mission is an expression of our spiritual identity. As Christians, when did we receive, when did you receive your identity? That I want to ask that question. And what kind of mission has God given you? you know, all of us have, if you're a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, a born Christian, we have a spiritual birth. The Holy Spirit has changed our hearts, gave us a repentant heart to confess not myself as my Lord and Savior, but Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And we, all of us, have gone through that transformation, that conversion experience. And when we became a Christian, God not only blessed us and changed our heart, but He 
crafted our lives. In fact, he knew from the beginning what our mission would be. Our identity was formed back then. Uh, Jesus, let's talk about Jesus a little bit. He's always the God, ultimate authority that has everything, say so and everything. Jesus, on his very first sermon on this earth, as he was talking about heavenly things, the kingdom of God, to fishermen, to farmer, to everyday people, he, as he was talking to, about the kingdom of God, in the, on the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, he tells them what their new identity is. And he made it very easy and simple to everybody. I wish I could preach like Jesus, don't you? Uh, you don't preach that much, right? But you would want to preach like Jesus if he preached. And uh, he said, you are the salt of the world. You are the light for the world. You bring a, become an influence uh, to a pr uh, tasteless place. You shine light in the darkest places of the world. And then he says, well, you are, we are, our identity as Christians are, light and salt of the earth. To put it in more concrete, simple terms, uh, our mission in life is to introduce people to God. The saltiness, the light, are all attributes of God. His truth, His light, His uh, life. And uh, our mission in life, all of us, no one excluded, every Christian's mission in life is to introduce somebody to God. That is our purpose in life. Very simply put, uh, that is a general mission that we all share as Christian, as people of God. But also, um, on top of that, all of us have a unique mission of how we express that saltiness, how we let them know of our light. We have unique gifts, we have uh, I unique identities that we express that uh, light and salt to the world, uh, of light and salt of God to the world. Some people are gifted in writing, right? They write blogs, they write amazing books, and they speak, and they are salt to the world by their writing. Some people express the, the saltiness and their illumination, their light, as they draw a picture. Uh, they introduce people to God. Others you know, use music to do that. Others use their um, you know, food <laughs> as a chef to shine God's glory in dark places. What we need to remember, remember is God has given every one of us the mission to introduce God to a dark world. So how can we fulfill our mission? The first thing we want to remember is, remember who you are, like the movie says, in you know, the Lion King movie says, remember who you are, that we are, our identity is salt and light to the world. When we remember, have this self-identity, a firm identity in who we are in Christ, we are in the position to fulfill our mission in life. When we remember that we are bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we are not just a product of our parents or just one, another human being on this earth, but God has paid with the precious blood of his son Jesus Christ for us. He was thinking of us and he planned us ahead of time. When we, when we come to that like realization in our life, it, it translates, it ex is expressed in the form of mission, doing God's mission uh, for us. And I want us to read this verse together in who reminds us of our identity. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 on the screen, please. Let's read it together. Wow, it's black. Um, can you read it? I'm going to read it here, and you just, uh, good luck. Let's read it together. <laughs> Ready, go. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. One more time. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Holy Spirit witnesses to us that we are children of God. I mentioned Lion King a while ago. Um, can you show us that picture? Is it black and white? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, oh, the quiz, a quick quiz. Who's that guy, the monkey on the left? What's his name? Anybody remember? You've watched Lion King, right? What's his name? <laughs> oh, wow, that's very... The first letter is right. <laughs> yeah, it's a Swahili uh, name. His name is Rafiki. Rafiki. You don't remember? Too young? <laughs> 
Rafiki, you know, as you remember, he's uh, the, like the counselor to um, Simba, right? And this, uh, this young Simba, he's uh, expelled from the kingdom by his uncle, was it, uh, forget it, Scar, Scar right? And uh, he didn't, he forgot who he was. And Rafiki, who is translated friend in Swahili, this friend comes along to uh, Simba and reminds him who you are. You are the son to the heir, to, to the king of this animal kingdom. Uh, and uh, so he draws him to the watering pool, the hole, and you know the cloud. Remember the you know father comes out and remember who you are. All that that. And it was uh, uh, Rafiki who reminded him who his identity was, and he was able to fulfill his mission. Uh, although it's not the Bible, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And going back to Romans chapter 8, can you show us that verse again? It says, the Spirit is our Rafiki. He is our friend. He is our counselor. He is our God who bears witness with our spirit that we are sons and daughters of God. When we listen to the voice of the Spirit, we realize our self-worth and our identity in God. If we do not dwell on what the Holy Spirit tells us, we will be overwhelmed and swept away by what, what, how the, what the world tells us who we are. The world evaluates us by our salary, our specs, you know, your set skill, skill sets, you know, what's your experience, your portfolio. But the Holy Spirit witnesses to us before God that this is my son. This is my daughter. This is the person of God that Jesus has blood, shed the blood with life blood to save. And I have handpicked you. I have crafted you out from darkness for a specific purpose and mission. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He is the Rafiki, so to speak, for us. That's why we always say, led by the Spirit of God. We don't want to be led by anything else. We want to be led by the Spirit of God. When we are led by the Spirit of God, confirming each day, each day who we are, our identity in Jesus Christ as sons and daughters of God, we are able to fulfill God's calling in our life. How can we fulfill the mission in our life? First, we have to remember that God gave us a mission from our spiritual births. Secondly, we must remember that God gives us the power to fulfill. God gives us, the, the same God who has birthed us, gives us the power, empowers us to fulfill his mission. Going back to the story of Jeremiah, there was a problem for Jeremiah. Although he had all this warm and fuzzy feeling and he was overwhelmed by you know, the blessing of God and you know, being calling him, I was honored to be called a prophet of the nations. As he looked at what his job description was, he, with all his body, with all his strength, he wanted to say to God, no, you got the wrong guy. In verse 6, he says, uh, I'll just read it from the Message Bible. It says, hold it, Master God. Look at me. I don't know anything. I'm only a boy. You've got the wrong guy. I'm so inexperienced. Now, the prophet, you have to be eloquent. You've got to be able to be a wordsmith, say a lot of good things. But God, I am nobody. I'm inexperienced. I am only a young boy. Jeremiah was afraid of what he was hearing. Although he was thankful and honored by who he was, God, how God had thought of him, but the daunting task was just too much for him. I think, brothers and sisters, we sometimes feel this overwhelming uh, in our life too. God uh, asks us, he challenges us to ta take on um, mission, missions, different parts, of, different things of God. Uh, in our life. Sometimes he calls us to be a spiritual leader. Sometimes he calls us to the mission field. Sometimes he calls us to be a Sunday school teacher. And you might want to speak the same as Jeremiah, saying, Lord, I am spiritually so immature. I just struggle finding my own path in life. Just to come to Sundays is a challenge to me, and you're calling me for a mission. God, thank you, but no thank you. This is too much. Maybe we have that hesitation, just like Jeremiah wants to go away, hide away from the calling of God. Going back to Jeremiah's situation, the reason was not just that he was inexperienced, that he was rejecting God's calling. He knew the circumstances, the historical context that he was, was asked to preach to. Because 
it was uh, Josiah's time. King Josiah's time had a, had a great revival, but his days were waning. And the days will come, well, dark days will come in Judah when the Babylonians will come attack the, the city of Jerusalem. In fact, it will be ransacked. They will be um, taken away to, uh, scattered all over the Mesopot Mesopotamia region. And he was supposed to preach to an ungodly people when the nation was being run over and he was supposed to uh, um, talk about condemnation of God. This was no thing, nothing that he wanted to say. And so Jeremiah, he called himself a boy and he resisted the calling of God. But at this time, Jeremiah had to remember that just as it was God who gave him this amazing mission, it would be God who would empower him, who would be the source of his power to fulfill this mission. And he made it very clear in the following verses 8 to 10. He promised at least two things to Jeremiah that God would do for him so he could fulfill God's calling. The first was God's protection. God would protect him all the way through. Second, God's word. God would give him in his mouth the word of God, the contents that he was supposed to preach to the nation of Judah. First, God's protection. Verse 8. Look with me. Do not be afraid of them, God says, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. God said, uh, I will be with you to deliver you. I will save you. I will protect you. Above all, I will be with you. You know, through the many mission trips over the years, I was at Cornerstone. I, there's an invaluable truth that I learned. The truth is that I could go anywhere in the world. I'm not just talking about tourist area, but anywhere in the world where Christians are not unwelcome even hostile to the gospel and to church. Even if I went to Tibet, you know, where it's snowing and there are, there's a monastery and people are uh, bowing and all these things are going on, I could go there safely and soundly and even pray. I realized that I could go up to the Lake Ishkol on um, the, uh, the, the, what's it called, the, the mountains of northern China, northwestern China, in uh, Central Asia, you know, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, visit there, the former Russian territory, uh, the former Soviet Union territory. I realized I could even go to uh, Turkey, Istanbul, uh, the center of it, and pray for the people. I've uh, realized I can go to Guatemala, the jungles of Guatemala, even despite my poor, even non-existent Spanish skills and knowing so little about the culture, I could still go there because everywhere of those places I mentioned, there was a missionary with me who knew the language, who knew the culture, who knew what to avoid, who knew where I could be safe. And God is saying to Jeremiah, I will send you to all these nations and I will be with you. I will protect you. Who knows better than God? Who knows the language? Who knows the culture? Who knows the heart of the people better than God? God was saying, I will be with you. In fact, Jesus promised us the same in the Great Commission as he sent us, all of us, to do God's mission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 29, uh, 19 and, and 20. He says, you know, therefore go, go, make disciples of all nations, right? Baptizing them and then uh, teaching them everything that I have taught you. What's the last phrase of this Great Commission? It says, behold, I, Jesus, will be with you to the end of the ages. Until I come back, I will always be with you. God, God Jesus, is pro promising his, uh, his very presence with us, his protection with us, so that we can fulfill the Great Commission, the mission that has given to, uh, been given to us. First, God promised the protection that Jeremiah needed. Secondly, in order to fulfill the mission of God, God promised the word of God. God was saying, I will provide the words that you need on your lips. You don't have to figure out and, and uh, be a wordsmith, a craftsman to say the right things eloquently to persuade people. And uh, God would use his words to bring about things to happen. That's what verse 10 is about. He will uh, topple these nations. Whatever Jeremiah says will come to fruition. Your words will have power and I will empower you. To that to for that to happen. Amen. And God called all of us 
as children of God. And we, when he called us, he gave us a mission and he gave us the power, empowered us to do his mission. He did not send us empty-handed into this world. Mistake him not. He gave us the Holy Spirit to always confirm what our identity, who, who we are. And also, he gives us the protection through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is with us. And not only that, he said, Jesus said to his disciples that, don't worry what you'll say in front of the authorities, when you, even when you're in court. Whenever you're even not a lawyer, you can't even you know, defend yourself. But I will give you the very words what to say. These are the very words of Jesus. I don't know if you ever experienced this, uh, but uh, you know, every time, I would say every time I go out with some of our friends here to you know, talk about God you know, on the street, um, I experienced this. They ask some hard questions. They ask questions like, if God is so good, why is there evil? <laughs> you know? And uh, you know, how do you know that your God is the only God? Aren't they all the same? You know, these are very difficult questions that we discuss in seminary. And I don't remember because it's been a long time ago, like 10-something years ago. Would you remember everything from your schooling days? Uh, but the other thing is, there is something always to say. I pray to God and Holy Spirit always gives us something to say from the scripture or from reason. He uses the uh, ill-equipped you know, people of God to do his amazing mission. Brothers and sisters, we all have been called to a mission of God. What is our mission? Our mission, again, once again, reminding ourselves, is our mission is to introduce God to a godless world. And we express that in various ways as we talked about. But ultimately, regardless of how you express your godliness, God's goodness to this world, regardless what expression, art, music, words, uh, product, whatever it might be, ultimately comes down to this. Our saltiness, our light to the world has to be spoken out to the world. Spoken and stated that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. We have to speak that out. Jeremiah had been given the mission of speaking God's word uh, to a uh, godless, God fear, God, not God, a ungodly generation. And the Holy Spirit, he promises his presence with us. Only when we obey the Spirit can we experience the promise that God has given to Jeremiah, the promise that God has given to his disciples, Jesus' disciples. Brother and sister, will you not use your life for something significant? Such a mission as this, mission of God. It was the uh, American philosopher of the last century that said this. William James said, The best use of life is to spend it for something that outlasts it. Think about it a little bit. The best way to use your life, to spend your life, is to spend it on, for something that outlasts your life. If you die and whatever you've done on this earth is outlasts your life, it becomes a legacy. It becomes something meaningful, significant. And we know that everything on this earth, everything that we do right now will perish. But the only thing that will be everlasting is the kingdom of God. Whatever we do for the kingdom of God will last forever. When we live this life for the kingdom of God, for the expansion of the kingdom of God, and for the, the mission that God has called us, that life has eternal worth. Don't you want to live that kind of life? I do. You know, as I close my sermon this morning, I reminded once again of my grandma who passed away two weeks ago. Uh, still fresh in my mind, you know, the sweetness of the farewell celebration, going home party, the worship service. My grandma was a very normal, you know, ordinary woman. In fact, she was maybe less than ordinary because she was not so well educated. She never went to college. She couldn't speak. Although she lived in Garden Grove, LA, uh, the LA region, she didn't speak English or, you know, fluently. And uh, she never went to college. She never uh, received theological education. But the reason that 
that uh, the memory, the, the set fragrance of, of, of spiritual fragrance is still alive in me is that because of the beautiful legacy that she has left. Seeing the people of God gathered there worshiping together, celebrating her going away party, going home party, it just blessed my heart. Would I leave a legacy like her? Would I be able to live a legacy like her? with all my degrees, my experience, and all the opportunities I have right now, would I be able to leave an eternal, everlasting legacy like she has? Because I see her descendants living all over the world, living for Christ, and living to expand the kingdom of God through her seed of faith. My grandma was a person of the Word of God. My grandma was a person of prayer. My grandma was a person of the Holy Spirit. And she fulfilled her mission in life. She completed it two weeks ago. Brothers and sisters, let us fill our hearts with the Word of God. In order for us to fulfill the mission that God has given us, yes, He will remind us, God will remind us of our, who we are. God will protect us for us to be ready for God to use us for his mission, we need to have his word in our hearts, in our heads, in our mouths. So the Holy Spirit can use it to fulfill his mission wherever we might be serving. That's why we're doing the Bible study after worship. That's why we are filling our hearts with quiet time word each day. And as our hearts are filled in the word of God, this word of God, not as a knowledge, but the words of God printed in our hearts, we will be ready for a day of battle, a day when God calls us to do your mission, to fulfill your calling in a dark world. Let's pray that God would remind us, Holy Spirit would remind us of who we are each day, and that we'll be filled with the word of God to be ready for God's mission and calling wherever we might be serving. Let's pray.